Welcome this morning to the 2021 Public Service Career Expo. We're so excited to have you join us this morning and learn about the one of the many career opportunities there are, and this one is in public administration. My name is Cindy Volante, and I am the Human Resource Manager for the City of Prairie Village. My experience in public administration is that I have been here uh, just over a year in this role. Prior to that, I was the human resource manager for Riley County in Manhattan, Kansas. And for a total of 29 years, I have been in the local government public sector. And so I would like to ask your instructors, if you're able to do so, to put your name in the chat and let us know who is attending this session and how many students you might have joining you uh, for the session today. So what we will do now is get started and we will introduce to you the individuals who are joining us live today. And you may recognize uh, some of these folks from the video that you just saw. So if you will, uh, we will welcome our presenters today and I will ask them to join us and uh, they will introduce themselves so this morning I have uh, Bridget Cobbins. Bridget, if you are available, we would like to have you uh, introduce yourself and tell us your position and how long you've been in your career. Good morning. My name is Bridget Cobbins. I'm an assistant county administrator with the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. And I've been working for the government for 26 years. Um, like a lot of you, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated from high school, went to college, um, ended up here at the government 26 years ago and had no idea that I would be able to navigate the organization as I have. I started at the lowest point or the lowest position within the organization, which is okay. You got to figure out where your niche is at within any organization. I started off in the police department, um, entering police reports, running background checks, advanced to our purchasing department where we purchase all kinds of supplies for the government. We will purchase a fire truck or we will purchase um, channel or rainbow catfish for our Wyandotte County Lake. Advanced to our um, land bank department as a manager, tax levy manager, um, was the unified government clerk for 10 years and now I'm one of the assistant county administrators. So no matter where you um, start in your career, do your absolute best where you're at because you never know where that could push you into your future. Excited to be here today and looking forward to continuing our conversation. Great, thank you, Bridget. Now I will turn to Shakiva Christian, if she will join us and introduce herself and how long she's been in her career. Good morning. Again, I'm Shakiva Christian. I work for the Human Resources Department for Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. I currently hold the position of Human Resources Manager. I have been with Unified Government for 21 years, um, been the HR Manager for about seven. Um, prior to that, I um, worked, been in Human Resources for Unified Government my entire tenure here. Um, I was a human resources analyst for the when I initially started um, prior to working um, as the HR manager. Um, um, my duties um, consist of um, attracting top talent for um, unified government. So um, we are a city county government. So all of the services that you would um, think go with city county, we handle it all from the police department. Uh, fire department. So on the county side, we have sheriffs, we have the street department, um, and then there's various administrative services um, that we have that we use to set, serve the citizens of Wyandotte County. And so my responsibility or my department is uh, responsible for hiring those individuals and making sure that we have that 
top talent to come to the organization and serve our community. Um, Unified Government is one organization that happens to have a residency requirement. And what I like about that is we have, we're basically working as neighbors to better our own community. So um, that's part of what I do is attract, retain, I do um, compensation. So I look at how we're paying our employees and how are we com competitive in the market? Are we paying individuals fairly? Um, we have several unions um, in our um, employee base. And so we actually have 13, which is a lot, um, um, probably more than a lot of organizations. So we do have to do union negotiations. Um, and if we happen to have any um, employee issues, you know, I help deal with that, um, employee investigations and things of that nature. And then I also try to do uh, employee recognition pro programs and things of that nature. So there's a wide variety of things that um, we do in the HR department to help um, run the, this entity um, and, and the people we serve in Wyandotte County. I did spend a little bit of time in human resources right after college in the private sector, um, about uh, eight years in the private sector in HR. And there is a difference um, between the, the public and private sector and that there is that um, impact that you have on the community. So I'm glad to be here this morning. And again, like Bridget, I'm, I'm excited to continue to um, have a conversation with you about public service. Great. Thank you. Now we will turn to Ashley Hand if she will join us and introduce herself and how long she has been in public service. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ashley Hand. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications with the Unified Government of Wyandotte County in Kansas City, Kansas. I've been in my role since February of this year, so I'm still a newbie to the organization. And I've actually gone between the public and private sector throughout my entire career. I'm actually a licensed architect, so I've worked in uh, cities all over the country, working on design projects as well as planning projects, but then was really excited to join the city of Kansas City, Missouri several years ago as the first chief innovation officer, which was a really interesting role in government, really looking at how do we do things uh, a little bit differently because the world around us continues to change and government has to change as well. So how do we, how do we guide that change? I also uh, worked out in the city of Los Angeles, for example, and looked at the future of autonomous or self-driving cars, uh, which was a really interesting uh, fellowship that I did in the public sector. And then I went, started my own company, worked and worked with government all over the country for several years, and then came back and joined the unified government because with the pandemic, we have seen such an impact on our community. And I really wanted to focus my work and my effort uh, to the day to day that you spend in your job, which is quite a bit of your life. Um, I really wanted to feel like I was giving back to the community where I live and where uh, my children have friends and where, uh, frankly, I saw there was enough opportunity to, to kind of get involved. So my job is really looking at how we communicate with our with our community as a whole. So thinking differently about how do we make sure you have the right information so that you can be part of the decision-making process because local government represents your needs and your priorities. So how can we do a better job of getting you the information you need to participate in that process? How do we create better channels for you to participate in that process, whether it's social media or meetings and activities, whether it's thinking differently about creating opportunities to partner with us as an organization to address some of the challenges that we see, whether it's in your neighborhood or citywide. And then the other kind of big component of the work that I do is really communicating within our organization. We, as uh, Shakiva mentioned, we have about 22, 2300 employees that all live in, in this community, in addition to working for local government. And so how can we make sure that we're doing a good job sharing information within our own organization and listening to our staff? Because so many times they are the eyes and ears on the ground for us and really understand how our community works. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Uh, I think I'm proof uh, that you don't necessarily have to have a linear path to your career, but you can build on the skills that you accumulate over time uh, and ultimately uh, finding yourself in public sector can be a really great space to land. Great. 
Thank you, Ashley. Our last presenter will be Dave Wimberly, and I will have him join us, introduce himself, and he will share with us how long he has been with uh, public service. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Wimberly, and I'm in the Human Resources Department uh, with the Unified Government. And my role here with the Unified Government is um, in risk management. Um, I've been in the public sector now for about eight years, and I've been in the risk management and um, risk management and insurance uh, industry for uh, close to 15 years now. Um, well, uh, part of my uh, duties here at the Unified Government is, as you uh, heard the others say, that we have about 2,300 employees. My job is to help make sure those employees stay uh, safe here at, um, at the Unified Government when they're working. So as you can imagine, that is a huge task uh, to do. Um, not only do I have to help make sure that they stay safe, uh, we have to make sure that um, the Unified Government is um, in compliance with different safety uh, standards um, um, uh, in our buildings and um, making sure that employees have the proper certifications for, for their jobs. I uh, also manage the insurance programs for a lot of our equipment and buildings and the vehicles that you see out on the streets. So I help make sure that those vehicles are properly insured. Uh, so if they happen to, to get into an accident, uh, we can um, make sure that um, we can get those vehicles repaired in a timely fashion. Um, like I said, I started off uh, in human resources um, in the private sector and um, like I said, about eight years ago, I moved into the public sector after uh, working in the insurance uh, side for a while as a consultant. And I got to say, working in the public sector, I feel like I can give more back to the community working in the public sector by, um, by interacting and making sure that there are um, programs in place to keep the workers safe and to help keep the organization in the city running smoothly. So thank Great. you for your time, everyone, and I'm looking forward to continuing this talk. Great. Thank you a lot, Dave, and thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, and so I would like to remind uh, the students that are listening uh, today that you may have noticed that we talked a little bit about agilities in the workforce um, and in the video that led into this session. So agilities are defined as your personal strengths and interests as they do relate to careers. Um, so if you identify uh, where your agilities can help you uh, think about your career, uh, you might uh, consider this as part of your future endeavors. And so what we will do now is uh, just turn it over to uh, question and answer time at this time. and and use your chat box uh, in the corner. If you have any questions that you would like uh, to share with our presenters today, I can say that I do have a question that ha has been presented um, already, which is a good one. Um, so I will start with Bridget. Um, the question is, is what is your job like post COVID? Um, and what would be a day-to-day -day, um, agenda that you would see uh, without the COVID involvement that we have had? Now, that's a good question. Um, COVID has that certainly, is a good question. yeah, it is. The COVID has certainly changed how we operate um, in our world, not only in the government sector, but even in the day-to-day -day lives of, of a lot of the students. But what we've transitioned and what we had to learn as a government is that we've traditionally had a lot of meetings on site, interaction, face to face. And as a result of COVID, we had to figure out a way to continue the dialogue and to continue the business of the government. Um, the government, unlike most businesses, we cannot just shut down. We still have to operate. And so we had to collaborate within our organization with our IT department with our administrator, with our mayor, with our commissioners, with public works, the police department, the fire department. We had to bring all those key stakeholders together because the police department still has to work. The fire department still has to run their calls. Dispatch still has to answer the call when you guys down 911. And so we as an organization had to figure out really strategically what we needed to do to make sure that our day-to-day -day lives was not impacted by a disease that we had no 
idea what it was going to intake. So what we did as an organization, we figured out ways to streamline our processes and to jump on board with having interactive um, learning and interactive engagement, just like you had to adjust in your schools over the past 18 months. We went virtual. Prior to that, the government was a little slow at moving around and navigating when it came to the virtual world. But guess what? When COVID hit, we had to figure out a way to be unique. We had to figure out a way to be proactive. And we had to figure out a way to make sure that no one was going to be slighted on the services that we did. So every single day, most of our meetings now are virtual. Um, we have our cell phones. We have our, our Surface Pros, our laptops. We're on the go. We're using our phones for interactive uh, meetings. And so we as an organization and as a government learned to adjust to a time in our history that we were not prepared for. But as a result of it, it showed us that you have to be flexible, that you may not always do things that you may have done in the in years past. And we've learned to just move with the flow of how things are operating and to make sure that our citizens in our communities and to make sure that the school districts are able to operate. We had countywide, statewide meetings with key people just to make sure that we were all on the same page and that we were all doing the same thing to make sure that our safety was number one. And so that was the one thing that we as an organization learned through this process is that we can't do it by ourselves. We have to have partners. We have to listen to our constituents. We have to listen to our students. We have to listen to parents and to our employees. And I think that was one of the biggest things that we had to learn during COVID is just that you may not do things the same way, but ultimately we have to make sure that the services continue to operate our cities and our counties. Great. Thank you, Bridget. I now have a question for Shakira. Uh, basically the same question. Uh, what type of work um, have you been doing and continue to do during COVID? Certainly, um, you know, things have to continue to operate, um, whether we're COVID, whether we're shut down or, or whatever the case may be there, um, you know, our, our normal hiring um, still has to take place because quite frankly, we, like Bridget said, we have to continue to run. We still have 24-7 uh, operations that serve the city and the county that, you know, we need to make sure that you know, are staffed and that, um, so those those things continue to happen. Um, I, I think since COVID, we did have to change direction a little bit or, or start some new programs. Um, there's been some changes in federal law um, regarding the, the, the types of leave that may be available to employees who happen to have maybe family members that have COVID or they themselves have been exposed to COVID. So we have to make sure we're staying um, abreast of all those changes in federal law and that we're uh, mm -hmm. complying with that, that we're meeting the needs of our employees. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, we do a lot of working from home from that for an, as of now. So what, how does that impact the workforce? How does that impact the services that we provide? Um, you know, how do we hold employees accountable even for the types of work they do? Um, and ensuring everyone is still being productive in the workplace. And so we had to look at policies all over again. We had to look at, you know, um, whether we're paying um, certain employees for certain um, types of leave and things of that nature. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so our business has uh, definitely changed. We had to, you know, reevaluate some programs and reevaluate not only the way we do business as a department, but how, um, that impacts our entire employee group um, and ensuring that we're meeting the needs of the departments um, throughout the, the pandemic so we can continue to serve our community. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have another question. Um, I'm going to start with Dave on this one and you can um, direct this uh, with your answer as you see um, to the best of your ability. Um, they want to know at uh, the Sumner Academy of Arts and Science. So welcome by joining us today. Um, um, they want to know, are you the panelists uh, 
is um, the ones who decide to fix potholes. And if you're not, um, can you share um, some of the processes that might go into the decision making of where they go uh, to fix our streets and roads uh, within the city and county? You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. That is a very good question. Um, I am not the one who makes the decision on um, when to fix a pothole. Uh, that is our public works department um, and street division that will um, fix the potholes. I do know they have a pothole um, truck that actually will go around um, throughout the day. We'll get, they'll um, kind of divide up the city in different uh, regions or sections. And they will take that pothole truck and they'll um, they drive it down the road. And when they do uh, notice a pothole, they will actually, everything is on this uh, pothole truck. Um, they have all the asphalt, all the equipment um, to put down um, uh, the asphalt, and then they can go ahead and seal it and then move on. So it's just, it's one or two trucks that will just go along the streets whenever there is a, um, whenever they notice there's an area that has a lot of uh, potholes in the, uh, in that particular neighborhood or on a section of street. So as far as how they do that, um, if there's a lot of calls that go into our 311 center um, about a particular pothole, they will um, definitely make a, a valiant effort to go to that particular location. But otherwise, it's just they're kind of doing routine maintenance um, of all the streets to make sure that there aren't that in as many potholes out there. Okay. I, I know Ashley has some. Yeah, I love that's great. Holes. Yeah, I just wanted to Ashley. weigh in on this. You know, I think uh, <laughs> no, this team does not necessarily make the decisions around who fill, who decides which pothole is filled. But we are part of public administration, so we see kind of across the entire organization all of the city and county needs, and then work through a budget process to decide kind of how do we balance all of these different needs? Because not every neighborhood has the same um, needs, but they also, uh, there's some universal ones, which we recognize that streets are an important one for everybody. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention is, because I'm the communication side of things, and Dave did mention it, is we do rely very heavily on our community to provide information about where the potholes exist. If you can imagine, we only have a few trucks that can go around and fill potholes where they go. Uh, it can be, uh, we, they do a lot of analysis of the conditions of our roads and things like that. So they have plans for different projects across the city, but we rely on people reporting through their cell phone, through our smart uh, app, or uh, by calling this call center called 311, which is where you can call to not only report an issue, but get information on any number of services that we offer. Uh, 311 is kind of the central resource that kind of puts all of us together uh, and helps connect the community to us as an organization. And so I encourage you to go and let us know when you see potholes and report them. If you have your own cell phone or if your family has a cell phone, uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, snap a picture and report it. And that's how we know where these problems are. So we really work in partnership with the community to kind of address these issues because frankly, there's more potholes than we have people. So <laughs> we need we need your help in identifying where to go. All right, great, thank you. So I will start with um, Shakiva on uh, this question. Can you uh, share with us uh, what students can do within high school um, to prepare themselves uh, for a position in public administration or public service? Absolutely. So um, as you can probably imagine, there are a lot of career paths and a lot of different areas um, in public administration. So it is going to deal or depend um, based on your area of interest, because we have, you know, such a wide, wide um, range of things to do. Um, but, you know, the, um, some positions may require um, a degree. So um, I'd always encourage, you know, um, if you go into like some of the administrative or administration type um, fields, whether it's accounting, whether it's um, human resources, whether it's public relations or um, 
public administration in general, those types of fields typically do require a degree. So stay on that that path of having great grades in your school so you can have acceptance into a, a college um, to obtain your degrees to go into those areas. But there are also very lucrative careers in other areas that may not necessarily require a degree. Um, like I mentioned, our law enforcement, uh, police, sheriff's department, street departments, there are um, some, a lot of those positions you can start out without those um, that college degree so you can certainly um you know just have a good strong work history good strong um, um passion for having um an impact on your community um and just um i would also say have a clean background <laughs> you know um you know we do background checks so depending on your position so making sure that you're staying out of trouble um, so that doesn't impact your future. So I know, um, you know, sometimes we make some decisions early in life, but just think about, you know, how that impacts your future and how that can impact, you know, the type of career that you want to go into. Um, so, yeah, um, it's kind of a general <laughs> just um, yeah. of what you can no, do. That's that's good. So I will turn to Bridget. Can you explain uh, to some of the students how um, some of the um, classroom uh, habits and classroom uh, interests uh, can lead into uh, them preparing for the workforce, uh, workplace, uh, such as time management, um, deadlines, and such? Absolutely. Um, the main thing is that a lot of what you're doing now represents what you'll need to do when you transition into adulthood. And it may not seem like what you're doing matters now, but it speaks volumes about your integrity. It speaks volumes about the work ethic that you'll have as an adult. Um, by going to school each day, um, you're participating in a form of government, even at that level, and you may not even be aware of it. Um, going to class on time, Going to class Monday through Friday, that's the normal um, or the typical work day for an adult, is preparing you for how you can transition into adulthood and, and working for the government or any job in the near future. Completing your task, your classroom task, um, making sure that you're prepping for your test, um, things like that that you're doing in high school is getting you prepared. When the bell rings, you're leaving for one class going to the next class, you don't want to be tardy, because if you start those habits of being tardy and not being on time and not taking things serious on the high school level, it's going to be difficult for you to adjust when you get into adulthood and when you get to the real world. And even in our jobs, we have to continue to be on time. We still have to follow the rules. We still have to listen to direction and we still have to make ourselves accountable. Just because we're adults and we work and we're in different positions throughout our organizations, we still have to make sure that the things that we do are going to make sure that we're positioning ourselves to advance throughout an organization to, or to advance our careers. So just keep following the rules that you establish at school. When you're on different teams, if you're on a football team, debate team, if you're on forensics or if you're on um, a club, the same processes that you follow in that regard. Just make sure that you're doing everything that you can do in excellence. And don't try to compete with others. Just be who you are and try to be the best at what you can be at. And if it's something that you think you may be interested in, speak to your teachers. Talk to any one of us. You have access to us from your local government. We would love to have any one of our students in our communities to shadow us or come to the unified government or to the communities in which you live in, the different school districts, the different cities and counties, they would all welcome and embrace the opportunity to have you to come into our organizations and see how government operates. Because it's more than just your parents paying the bills for you to stay in your house to support the operations of the government. By you working, you're paying your taxes, you're investing into your community, and it's important that we know what you're interested in because eventually, we're going to be retired and we're going to be looking for your information and we're going to be looking for your talents to come and fill the positions and be the new Ashley's with that has an architect degree or to be the new Shakivas or the new Cindy's and Dave in HR. So we're excited to know that 
you are guys are going to be filling our roles in the near future. So continue to embellish all the skills and the agilities that you've discovered are your strengths and embrace that. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm going to lead uh, that into uh, Dave. And if you could share with us what skills uh, you found were very beneficial for you going into your career. Mm. Um, for me, probably communication is probably the biggest, one of the biggest ones. Because um, I have to, in, in my role, I have to, a lot of times I have to explain a lot of complex um, situations to people who may not be familiar with uh, who may not be familiar with insurance and how um, insurance works, or if uh, an uh, employee is injured and um, and they have uh, certain like medical restrictions, having to explain that to their supervisor um, and making sure that um, that employee can return to work safely and not further injure themselves. So, being able to communicate um, complex ideas to uh, supervisors or to uh, or to employees is very um, is definitely needed, and also making sure that communication um, that um, that if you're going to say that you're uh, communicating different timelines to individuals as well, and um, making sure that you are meeting those uh, particular timelines. So being punctual, um, as Bridget mentioned, you know, making sure you're making making it to class or to meetings on time. Um, being punctual and also one of the another skill that I have to use a lot of times is just being analytical. Um, a lot of the decisions that I have to make are based off of um, what's happening either with a particular claim or potential like uh, I deal a lot with um, uh, a lot of data that I have to trend well trends that um, might see in safety as somebody's getting injured. Um, we've had a lot of people getting injured doing a certain task. Maybe we need to relook at how that task is performed. So, being analytical and being able to um, find different little trends on different things is uh, is a big part of my job right now. Okay, great. So I will turn to Ashley. Um, Dave and Bridget both mentioned uh, communication. So, can you describe? Um, we had uh, some discussions yesterday on communication and what the best form of communication um, a student can develop now uh, that will benefit them into the workforce. So can you describe or give examples on uh, that for them? Absolutely. So I think it's important when you are thinking about communications to think not just about what you're saying or what you want to convey, but how that information is being received. We all have our own lives, our own biases. So really being sensitive to that can really help you be a more effective communicator, recognizing that you know, not everybody reads an email the same way or feels comfortable picking up a phone and calling or likes text messages. There's a lot of different ways of communicating between people and recognizing that the way you prefer to communicate is not necessarily the way the person wants to receive or hear information. So just being very sensitive to that and if recognizing you have your own preferences is a really important thing. So when I think about communication skills as a whole, it is good to work on you know, your written skills and how you can convey an idea concisely and accurately, but also how can you speak to those ideas? Because I think a lot of times, particularly in the digital age where it's so easy to resort to our smartphone and limited characters in communication, it is important to remember that we're all human beings and it's important to just sometimes have that face-to-face -face conversation or pick up the phone and have that conversation. And th that's just something that has really changed quite a bit with technology and also across generations. The, the reality is, is that People are using different tools today than they were 25, 30 years ago. And so there's a lot of generational differences in how we communicate. And that again goes back to the fact that we just need to be aware of what other people, how they are kind of receiving the information as when we consider how we can be effective in communicating to, to somebody and with somebody. It's not just about 
information out, but listening, taking information back in and understanding it and taking action on that information that you receive. So closing that loop can really help build trust and help build a better dialogue that can allow us to do more very quickly. Okay, very good. Well, I think uh, we are done uh, with our time allotment for uh, questions. So thank you presenters very much for your information today. Uh, we appreciate uh, you taking the time. And so at this point in time, I would like to uh, remind uh, the students that are listening today that if this career has sparked your interest, uh, we want to end by letting you know of some of the opportunities designed just for students uh, within the public administration sector. Uh, so please visit the website of www.careerexpo.org. And this is going to provide a link to um, areas for job shadowing, internships, and volunteer opportunities. Uh, this will be an, uh, a great way to get involved and take advantage of these opportunities uh, that you might see in your future career um, and something that might be right for you in public administration. So again, we thank you for uh, joining us in the public administration section, and we hope that you have a very good rest of your session and enjoy your day. Thank you.